to 2 Kings chapter 4. Make it real simple. Why don't we just start at verse 1? <laughs> I'm going to say this because I'm going to try, but no promises. And if you're more excited about a short service than a move of God, well, the problem isn't me or the church. But if you walk into the bathroom and look at that thing, silvery thing on the wall, it will help you to know what is. Hello? <laughs> Amen. I, I, I spend a lot of time grooming myself to I want to look presentable when I leave the house. When all intents and purposes, we need to spend more time grooming that joker that lives on the inside of the guy we're grooming on the outside. Well, maybe some of y'all got it like that, but I don't. I need the word of God to fix me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. So we can see that there's a, uh, for lack of a better word this morning, a ministerial connection here. Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Transparency beckons me to say, I find myself in this position quite often. Speaking to a, another pastor who pastors back east, he, he'll know who he is when he watches. And it's amazing the similarities of what's going on across our constituency. There's a lot of people, thankfully, calling pastors about what do I do? Some people are figuring it out that figuring it out that the government doesn't have the answer. If you go back even 40 years, 50 years, the same problems they're arguing about what they're going to fix are the same ones they're they're running on now. And the person in there now is not responsible for them. But he is responsible for letting us know where the problem is and the other ones don't like him for it. That's all I'll say about that. He's not perfect. None of us are. But he definitely has revealed some major issues. I don't want to talk about politics, but I wanted to bring out the point that government is not the answer. It's not the answer. More stuff is not the answer. That's the rich man. I mean, I can go on and on. It's not. Money's not the answer. We do have an answer. And sometimes we're in possession of it and don't realize it. The creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. What hast thou in the house? And she said, thy handmaid, I like how she defines herself. She's placed herself in the form of a servant. Look, if you keep coming in here and acting like you're healed, don't get upset that you never get healed. If you never come in here with a need, don't get mad that God's not moving. If you, you, if you notice, Jesus was surrounded plenty of times by a lot of people, but it's the one that said, I had a need. That That's right. That's right. See, now, I, I don't want us to come in here in rags and looking like a bunch of idiots or anything like that. But because we put all this stuff on, we want to come in here and act like we got it all together. But like that song just said, I'm living proof and don't forget <laughs> Even though I've been here a little while, I'm still living proof today. But yeah. 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 he still saved me from what he saved me from. Hello. Yeah. I'm still proof God can do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> All I got is some oil. 
And he said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors. <laughs> Even empty vessels. Get all the empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and thy sons. I like how this whole obedience to God is a family thing. Don't leave your kids out. And shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought all the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Why don't you set your Bibles down for a moment and why don't we just take a moment here and let's, let's as an individual and corporately, let's, let's ask God today to speak to us, to speak to each one of us as an individual, to, to minister unto us as a household, to not let us leave anything on the table to not leave any miracles that we could be experiencing because we missed the message. Lord, let us hear what the Spirit says to the church today. Let, let, let us walk in faith and trust. Let us believe again and be obedient to your word that we might partake of the blessings that you have for each and every one of us. Hallelujah, Lord, we will not fail to give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. We're thankful, God, for everything that you do for us every day. We're thankful for our right mind and a heart that understands, God, our need for you. That God, we're not allowing the opulence of the things of this world to keep us from the understanding that we need you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I read through this story multiple times and a phrase really stirred me and pulled on me and quickened me this, this week. But before I go any further, I'm going to read another very familiar verse to you. In Joshua 24 and 15, it says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you'll serve. Choose. I think one of the things that we miss or fail to realize on a, on a daily basis is that we are choosing. Some, some of you ministered and affected a lot of people yesterday. They had an opportunity to be here. They chose. There are some people that even call this, this, this church building and our fellowship their church. They choose today not to be here. And it's not just today. It's a regular occurrence, but it's a choice. And when you realize this is Joshua speaking and you realize the history of the children of Israel, the struggles that we have, I, I, I'm, I'm going to pull the curtain back and play Toto for a minute. We, we, I understand that there's evil spirits and I understand that there's wickedness in high places, but can I tell you, we need to quit thinking we can blame everything on, ooh. Yeah. Our greatest problem is our struggle with pleasure. Yeah. We want to be pleasured all the time. Everything we do, we, I like this, and I like that, and I got to have this, and I got to have that. And 
Pleasure is our biggest problem. And because we live in the greatest, most opulent country on the planet, we have access to just about anything. You want Chinese food, you can go get that today. And if you want German food, you can get down there to the Hofbrau and get yourself some sauerkraut. If you want pancakes and waffles, if you want a car, they're going to make a way for you to get that car. We kind of get that American attitude about us. And we serve our flesh. And so he's talking about choosing. Choosing. We're choosing. We've been choosing for however many years you've been alive. You're choosing. You've surrounded yourself with what you love. You are as worldly as you want to be and you are as spiritual as you want to be. Don't ever put it on God that, well, God, will you move? Oh, he's going to sit back when you stand before me. He's going to look at you and he said, what? You want to meet him? I was there all the time, but you was moving in the things of the world. You didn't choose me. You didn't. Whether the gods which your father served which were on the other side of the flood. When Moses came down off the mountain, were they really serving a golden calf? Can you really serve a statue? Can feed it, water it. But if you read what they were doing around, the golden calf was an excuse to do what they wanted. <laughs> calf wasn't getting no glory. pleasure was. They were. We like to mask our our religious ceremony. Oh, I'm serving some. Oh, no, you're serving yourself. So Joshua, all this is going on. If you're going to finally take the promised land, you've got to make the right choices. You've got to make the right choices. So serve which are on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But he makes a statement. He says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I like that he said we because it incorporates the I, but he's not doing it alone. Because let me tell you something, whether you serve God fully or the world fully, you're not doing it alone. You can't turn around and say to your children, do as I say, but not as I do. They're going to take what you're doing and take it farther. So we see that a household is important. Doors and gates. Got a couple here. Are points of entrance and exit. We place locks and other mechanical means by which we can secure an otherwise easy point of access. Mm -hmm. It's important to have a safe home. A secured home. A home is a sanctuary, is a place of security. In fact, Paul admonished Timothy that homes need more than just mechanical security. And he, he talks in his reference to being uh, in the office of ministry, or the, the title bishop there literally means ministry. He just right, that's a good work to desire. But then he says, hey, if you're going to do that, you've got to be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, so were good behavior. What? Given to hospitality, who, who, who have you invited to your house? Apt to teach. Who are you teaching? Nobody, God doesn't empower your title. I'm this, anoint me. That doesn't work that way. You can't beckon your title and invoke it to power. He's good. It's what you're doing. He's going to anoint. God can't. God can't. God can't anoint me to do something great for God if I'm if I'm wrenching on cars all the time. I may like doing it, but I'm not going to go and pray. God anoint me and then go in there and spend all day. Hey, ladies. God, it God ain't going to anoint you. 
to look fine. <laughs> Spend all the time you want on it. It's not a gift of the Spirit. <laughs> as fine as you are. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? And he's talking about a home apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One, those are hard for men. See, the Bible talks about ladies. Paul talks about them. He says, hey, a woman needs to be, you know, submissive and, and chaste and modest apparel. But when he deals with the man, that men everywhere would lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Why? Because wrath and doubt are our number one problems. We're, we're, we're different. We're made up different. And he goes on. And one that ruleth well his own house, having his children and subjecting with all gravity. For if a man not know how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, ladies, you can go find, there's a wonderful chapter in Proverbs 31 that will give you keen insight the part of a woman she plays in a godly home, not to mention what Paul talks about. But in the text that I read, it's an interesting story. The prophet Elijah has begun to spread his wings. He's got the mantle. He's followed Elijah for a period of time, and he's moving forward, and, and he's doing things for God. And There's an advantage that we get when you read the Old Testament in light of where we are today. It helps us to see the New Testament, in lack for a better word, in a more 3D type way. Because the Old Testament generally presents the truth in the form of a life picture. When we look at the Old Testament in light of the New Testament, we actually discover some clarity. I'd like to draw our attention to an interesting thought. And I do want to keep it short. I simply want to talk about, shut the door. Because when the prophet emphasizes, you're going to borrow vessels, you're going to get some oil, you got to gather your sons, you're in a desperate situation. If all you got is oil in that, that means there's nothing else. There's no meal that, and when you get it all done, shut the door. The emphasis on the door or the door being shut really pulled at me. It attracted my attention. I reminded in Matthew 6 and 6, it says, But thou, when thou prayest, stay with me this morning, please. Enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Shut the door. Shut the door is symbolic. Shut the door is, 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 is a way of shutting something out and shutting something in. Matthew 25 and 10 says, And while the, they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with them to the marriage, and the door was shut. One tiny little thing separated those that made it, those that didn't. Those on the right side of the door and those on the wrong side of the door. Now listen, the foolish ones had had oil in the past, but the problem is, now let me talk to you saints that have been around a little while. They let their oil run out. Have you let your oil run out? Now, you still look the same. You still dress the same. You know how to praise the Lord. You know all the songs. You got your regular seat. You may even have a position and do something. You may be involved, but your oil's run out. The door got shut on them, and they were on the wrong side. So we need to pay attention to shut doors. Honestly, 
it's really impossible for me to cover all the insights for each of these verses, so I don't plan on doing it. But I do hope to draw your attention to the fact that, biblically speaking, it's not just a simple part or aspect of the story, but rather there is a purpose. There is a reason for the specific instruction given by the man of God, Elisha. It's difficult today because we live in a society that's lost its value of specific instruction. We've really adopted and had a resurgence of the demise of Genesis. Hath God said. In fact, right now, if you were to write that down, you're going to find how many times you say that in a day. Hath God said, I really got to be prayerful. Hath God said, I need to be involved in the church. Hath God said, I got to teach a Bible study. Hath God said, I really got to be a biblical Christian. Well, close wasn't good enough for the five foolish, was it? So from our text, I hope to express the value and importance of a closed door. We find in our story a widow. That in itself brings pain. That shows someone caught in the throes of bereavement having lost not only a husband, but a godly husband. Someone that stood at the center of the household. It's a man of God. Some commentators would suggest that this man who left behind a family was also a prophet. We know he had a wife and at least two sons mentioned in the text. We find that he had finally transitioned from his labor to reward, leaving behind his family. When we read the text, we find that after he died, his loved ones found themselves in a very tough situation. So the widow comes to the man of God, <laughs> to the prophet, and cries that the credit. Now, we know they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have caller ID. <laughs> See, today when the credit is called, you can oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I don't need that letter. Well, they didn't call. There was no caller ID and no letter. So she had a real concern. Things were different then. There was no government assistance. There was no programs that she could go fill out some paperwork, no subsistence paperwork she could fill out and apply for. They had a different way of handling debt then than they do now. You, you're not going to go down and file a chapter 13 or a chapter 11. You're not going to File that. You're going to have to face up to what's owed. There's no running, no ducking, no hiding. And back then, they could take your kids. Now, I know some of y'all screaming, boy, Jesus, get them to my house tomorrow. Get this. <laughs> Come get them and straighten them out for me. <laughs> well, but back then it was different because sons, especially sons, were also her future. Because sons take care of their mamas. So this woman had a real concern. She feared the creditors would take her two sons as payment. Children, especially sons, were taken from the home to either serve as servants or be locked in the prison. Jesus told parable in Matthew 18 about a king who called the servants to check their accounts. One was found that owed him quite a bit. He was about to deal harshly with him and this 
servant asked for patience and he would repay. And so the king had compassion on him. But as soon as that forgiven servant left and got out of the presence of the king, now I'm talking to us, listen to me. This, I know I'm telling the story in there, but put yourself in the story. He first thing went and found someone that owed him money. And the guy like that owed him money implored him like he the guy had implored the king for mercy. Ah. Uh -uh. He refused. And had him thrown into prison. You got to ask yourself how much like Jesus you really are. Let's go, let's go. See, he, he wanted to open and shut case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we like to look around the room and think we've gotten somewhere. We can look around and judge people. We drive down the road and think we're all that in a bag of chips. Well, these bunch of, they need me or God in their life. quick to make our little slick comments about who did this and what we've done for someone else. I wonder if we bragged about how much God done for us instead of how much we've done for people where we'd be at in God. I wonder what will really happen is if, and think about this, if you turned around and every time you thought to say something about something, you know God been good to me. And then get specific. I was an idiot from the day I was born. I don't have no education, and God bless me. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm blessed way beyond where I ever could have been. If God hadn't have stepped in and the world had its way, I wouldn't be looking so pretty right now. If God hadn't pulled me out of that pit, the problem is, is he does dig us out of the pit and brings us into his palace. But the problem is after we've been there a little while, we think we belong there because God shut the door on the enemy. You, if you don't think there's a hedge around you from living for God, go ask Job about it. How many got some standards because you're living for God? How many? Those aren't yours, those were his because without him you never would have put him there. So the reason Job had all that around him was because he was a godly man. So God had to say, okay, Satan. I, God had to remove that hedge because the way Job lived protected him. But Job lived that way because of his walk with God. So the hedge that was there was placed there by Job's lifestyle and living for God. Not because of Job, but because of God. We like to take credit, but well, if we took our knowledge of God away, where would we be? We'd be a groveling mess and of more greater than an amoeba in the gutter somewhere, living in some primordial society soup. Thank God. Thank God that when he pulled me out of the pit, he didn't just pull me out, but he started working on my heart and working on my mind and getting me to realize, wait a minute. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and we start adapting things into our lives, the aspects and the attributes of God. And I never want to get to the place I forgot where I really would be without his hands in my life. And unlike this guy, I don't want to look to throw anybody in some, some, some type of moral prison and shut the door on them because they never got to see me like that. Can I get an amen? amen? So when the king found out this guy did this, wow, he came down on him like a ton of bricks. Hypocrisy bothers God. The point really being here is that if you're cast into prison for a period of time, what would it really suffice for the debt you owe? So here's this mother coming to Elijah. Her need was extremely important. It was valid. It was a real concern for the welfare of herself and her sons. That these were her sons. They're gonna come, they're gonna come get my babies, and I won't have a say anymore. 
They're all that she had. This widow was worried. She was about to lose everything. So if you think about it, and I'm just, I'm just going to talk to you for a minute, young people. When you get paid, pay your tithes, but don't forget to pay you. The Bible talks about stewardship. Set something aside. If you got money in the bank, it's supposed to be there. It doesn't belong to the department store. It doesn't belong with you trying to keep up with the Joneses. This situation that's happened to this lady is because there was no nest egg or the nest egg was gone. And so get rid of that restless spirit that because you got money you need to go buy a new outfit or you need to go buy a plant or you need to go buy this or you need to go buy that. Realize that the day's coming that it may be raining and you might need a savings. So take that little bit out for God and take that bit out for yourself and live modestly. Don't live at the end of your income. Are you hear what I'm saying? So she's found out there's a situation here and she approaches Elijah with a heartfelt plea. And Elijah responds to her because listen, there's just a concept with God that you gotta get. And he says, what shall I do for thee? Now let's listen to what her request wasn't. Can you give me a hundred bucks to tide me over to a payday? <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. But I'm trying to be where we really live. She wasn't asking for two or three hundred dollars till next month. Could you pay my utility? But she didn't say that. Didn't ask for rent. Now, I... And I don't know if these precious folks, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I try to be sweet and nice, but I had someone call me yesterday, and I get calls, you know, all the time. People ask for my first, ask me for money all the time, and I, I call. Well, where do you go to church? <laughs> I could say, well, where do you bank? Go get some money out of there. I haven't put any in there. Then you ain't gonna get none out from there either, are you? Now, now listen. And I tell them, listen, I know you're in a bad situation. I'm not trying to be hard, but you can't expect to glean where you haven't sowed. That's right. Amen. And I, as a pastor, have an obligation to those in the church yeah. instead of those saying, well, I was intended to come. Well, come on, be faithful. Let's see what happens in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, they get mad and get upset. And I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm going to have an obligation to those that are faithful to the house of God and not those that don't show up. Everybody's got the intentions of being faithful, but until... All right, so anyway, this family required not just a handout, a hand up, continued support. See, in our culture today, we go, well, go get a job. Make them boys get down to McDonald's, start flipping some burgers. But the Old Testament times and the culture she was in is, was different. There were no employment opportunities for women at this particular point in history. She could be in, industrious and she could. And if you go read about the things that they could do back then, she didn't have anything in the house to do that. But trust me, she wasn't sitting around the house eating bonbons. And we've had this discussion. <laughs> All this aside, her plight was even more difficult because widows back then re relied completely and entirely on charity. In fact, Acts chapter 6 verse 1 talks about, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, the Greeks and the Jews, because their widows were neglected in the daily menstruation. So here's Elijah with a social dilemma. A widowed woman with a couple of boys. So we can feel the compassion that Elijah has as he searches for a way to help this person. And his initial response kind of seems strange. But he's about to reveal 
what I want you to see today. You don't need a community organizer. He was about to reveal to her the real 401k. The real remedy for unemployment and financial assistance. He was going to give her the inside scoop. But we have to understand this morning that God is concerned about every need right now with whatever you face. And we're all individuals and they're all different, but God is aware. He is concerned about our condition. God is intimately aware of your need right now. But like this widow, there's a way to go about it. The prophet said, I, I don't know what I can do for you, but I know the one that's able to make a way where there doesn't seem to be a way. I know the one that can take nothing and make something. That's important. So he asked the widow, what do you have in the house? What do you have? She says, there's nothing in the house. It's just me and the boys. Because she probably sold everything to pay whatever she could. And up to this point, I got nothing of value. Don't we do the same thing today? I don't have anything. We got garages and closets and clothes we can't wear. Let's not even go there. We tried to remedy that a little bit yesterday, but you know. So we get second jobs. We think about taking our retirement. And we're taught to rob our tomorrows for today. And not only do we do that physically, but we do that spiritually. We're so busy with pleasure that we never get spiritual. We're so busy thinking, I got an American right to do this and right. And you do. But the thing is, when Jesus comes, do you want to call it an American right or an apostolic heritage? Because I tell you right now, if Jesus came right now, y'all going to be like, I've been here. I ain't been missing. Right? <laughs> We'll try everything before we try Jesus. Why would I, <laughs> coming to church and trying Jesus doesn't seem to float our boat like we like. But I nevertheless, when all else fails, and there's no other alternative but to come to the church, people just kind of meander back in. And the woman responds that there's nothing in her house but a pot of oil. And, all, and likely it was olive oil. Everything else is gone. And she says, well, man, I'm in a fix. Let me go talk to Pastor Elijah. He's, he's the new preacher. He's the new pastor. Elijah's gone. Well, let me go hit him up. I done heard that he's going to get a double portion. <laughs> let me go hit the man up. <laughs> so Elijah said, well, what am I going to do for you? I get your predicament. And he asked her, well, I, I, okay, let me. Do only thing I know to do. What do you got in your house? Because if you remember, Elisha's mentor, Elijah, dealt with another widow. I hope you know your Bible if you don't. What resources do you have? What? Everybody say, what do I have? Her, hand, her, her response was telling your handmaiden has nothing at all except <laughs> except a little oil. Isn't that just like us? When we think about our resources, we don't think we have anything to offer anybody. I, I think it's kind of funny that when you think about Peter and altercation he was happening and gets a little frustrated. He said, Jesus, we sacrificed all for you. And then when the rubber meets the road, he runs off and he's out on a boat. Well, wait a minute, where'd you get that boat? We act like we give all, but we always got that boat hidden out back. We got that. I've given all, I've sacrificed all. Oh, Peter, where'd you, Peter, where'd you get that boat? <laughs> so we don't think we have anything to give and we're sitting in the pews year after year thinking, I don't have anything to contribute. I don't have anything to give. 
and you got that little, well, I don't mean to tell us guys, but every man's got, you know. <laughs> we got something. We got that little stash, that, you know, that little comfort buffer. Can I get an amen from a, man, from a real man? Real men carry a pocket knife and got a stash. That's just all there is to it. And when I say stash, y'all need to get out of, I'm not talking about that kind of stash. I'm talking about a financial stash. <laughs> Mad money. Yeah. Sad thing is my wife figured it out. She knows me. Things, she wants something or something going on. She says, well, wait a minute. What about, hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> and I'm watching a couple look at each other right now. <laughs> hey. <laughs> no. But she goes, hey, I got nothing but a, a little bit of oil. That word except is such a big thing. And I want you to realize that the little that you got is a big thing in the right place. In your hand, it is a little thing. But don't tell me what you don't have. Prophet saying, tell me what you do have. And while she thought she had nothing, Elijah saw, Elijah saw something. That little bit of oil. It didn't seem like much, but it was the key to her situation. And whatever you have is the key to your situation. And it's amazing because we're given a glimpse of how God still works today. Remember that, that, that little boy's lunch in John 6 and 9 when everybody's hungry and there's thousands of people and they didn't have nothing. And one of the disciples walks up, here's a boy with a little lunch. It ain't nothing. Oh, you're right. But you put it in. Mm, you put it in the right hands. You take that little and. Mm. To her, that small jar of oil was insignificant. What good could it possibly do to erase the enormous debt hanging over her head? What was that little oil to a big problem? Elisha is setting her up because not only is God going to do a miracle, God still wants to work a miracle out in your situation. He, he's, that God concept is still alive and well today. If you'll get to the place and offer the little that you have, God can take it and do something out of nothing. God proved this concept from the foundation of the word. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved. You can't bypass the fact that you have to give God what little you have. When we give what we have, we get the miracles we want. God wants us to exercise faith. He wants us to participate in the miracle. But sadly, in America, we act more like the rich young ruler than the lad with the lunch. Both had a lot to lose. One was asked to give and refused to give even a little. The other saw the need and gave all he had. Find yourself in there somewhere. So the widow has this little pot of oil. The wonderful thing about the man of God is he knew it was enough for a miracle. He learned of the widow of Zarephath and what Elijah had done. And I'm pretty sure as he walked and talked with Elijah and mentored, he, Elijah instilled in him the, 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 the excitement and the power of all that had happened and the belief and the faith and the fact that, can you imagine a man of God walking up to a widow that's got barely enough to eat and two couple of sticks and gonna go eat it and go die and say, get to me first? I tell you what, I can't tell you, tell you one of the hardest things for a preacher to do is to preach when he sees someone in need and says, you pay your tithes and give offering? 
So I don't want nothing from you. But you need what God can do with that little bit. You need, I've, learned, I've learned that. If you've learned that lesson, say amen. amen. <laughs> Do you believe? Do you believe? Are there any believers here today? Yes. What'd that cost you? It's easy to say I love you, but you're going to stick around when you don't. <laughs> Holy mo- what? On. Hold on a minute. Y- y'all y'all bo- what'd that cost? So let me tell you something. I don't want you to tell anybody you believe. Get them convinced by your actions. Next time you got out with someone. Don't let nobody know it. Matthew 18. But they owe me. Thought you was a believer. Maybe this is too much today. Say it with your actions. We'll be the first ones to say someone do it. Your actions speak louder than words. Hey, Peter, where'd you get that boat? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Listen to me. Listen, listen to this verse. Please him. Now, we're good at pleasing ourselves. Are you pleased with yourself? Come on, you look in the mirror today. Look and think. You got stuff stored up. You got a bank account. You got a nice you, you get you, You're pleased. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Elijah next gives two sets of instructions. And what, they kind of seem unimportant, but both, both instructions are vital. The first instruction, go borrow. Oh my God. That's humiliating. And not only do you want me to go borrow, you want me to go borrow from my neighbors. Well, you don't think they know what's going on in our house? I'm supposed to be the... There's a man of God living in this house, and now I'm borrowing? I'm needing? Go borrow vessels from your neighbors. The neighbors know she's in trouble. What do you want? What do you want these pots for? What are you going to do with them? She's not only being obedient to what she was instructed, she's teaching the neighbor something. Look, I don't need a handout, I need a hand up. Borrow as many vessels as you can. Take all of those empty vessels home with you. Okay, what's the next question? Anybody? Well, what are you going to fill them up with? She's already made a declaration. Now everybody knows she went to everybody to borrow. Well, you only got a little oil. Now what are you going to do? But if you look at what's not done here, she never questioned him. She never questioned him. She had faith and she did what the man of God instruction instructed her to do. Faith always precedes your miracle. Faith always precedes your miracle. But showing up when everything says quit. Go read Job if you want to know what faith looks like. She did not question. (laughs) She did not ask. In the pain and struggle of her situation, she simply believed. She did not analyze the possibilities or the impossibilities. She simply walked by faith and not by sight. 
you can go to Hebrews chapter 11 and go through a list of people. What I love about the word of God, and I need you to hear me, is God doesn't hide the mistakes, the failures, or the imperfections of people. That should make someone shout. That, that should make you... Re I know I shouldn't be here. I, I know. Sadly, and I, you sang the song. You sang the song about living proof. That's wonderful. But there ain't nothing more beautiful than watching someone be living proof. Oh my God, look what God did in They Look what God did in there. Oh, look at that. They were on drugs. They were a mess. They were uneducated. They weren't. So look what God did. They, oh my God, look at that. Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Moses. All those flawed, but faithful. Why do they deserve a miracle? They obeyed the concept of giving God what little they had. Faith without works is still dead, folks. James says very succinctly in James 2, 18 through 20, read this, get this, apply this. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I'll show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. Wonderful. But that's not enough. You can't believe that. See, some of us kind of see in our pew and find, I believe in one God, I'm saved. And never live a life acting on it anymore. It's funny, why are the devils still at work and the saints aren't? The devils also believe in tremble. But what thou know, O vain man, faith without works is dead. Wow. Jesus can't do anything for you if you're not willing to do what Jesus instructs you to do. You got a test? Study. You can't expect a good grade if you don't study. Oh, I'm going to pray for a good grade, pray for a good grade. Don't. Really? We pray, but we still got to work on what we prayed about. You can't pray for good health and then not eat well. You want to lose weight? Start eating right. Start exercising. Sleep well. You want to get healthy? Those are things you just need to do. You can't pray the calories out. You pray over the, we do it for fun all the time. Let's pray the calories out of this. They didn't go nowhere. They're fixing to go in you. Hey, are you hearing me? Your miracle depends on how much you really believe it. You've got to believe it. You say, oh, Crow, I don't know. This is really not taking off today. Well, does it need to take off or does it need to take root? Because in Matthew, Jesus, it says, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. I don't want a semblance of revival. I don't want just what looks like might be revival. I really want to see people come in and start living for. I want to offend some of you right now. Don't you. Give me some new people still on fire for this thing and not some stoic old timer that knows the word but no longer worships. I'll tell you right now, don't listen to a preacher if he won't worship. Don't listen to a lady sing if she won't worship. If you're not going to still put God in his place, maybe you should get out of place. He still delivered me. I'm telling you right now, I don't belong here. I'm going to give him praise. He took what little I got and he saved me. Because when you truly believe the word of God, you'll act on it. There's no way you're going to go in a week go by without doing outreach, without teaching a Bible study, without knocking a neighbor's door. You let me worry about this house. You better start worrying about your house and your neighbor's house. There's a lot of empty vessels for you out there. 
There's a lot of, where's your neighbor at? Oh, God, use me. When's my time behind the pulpit? You should have a pulpit at your house. Which pastor going to let me get up and teach a Bible study? Are you teaching one at your house? What about my ministry? What about it? This is about the Lord's ministry. If you're not reaching souls, you've confused the stage. And this isn't Hollywood. This is not an act. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you can walk around here thinking you're better because you know some verses of scripture, but you're not teaching, sit down. We want people that can act upon their faith. Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Your first step towards your miracle is your faith. The widow didn't exercise. I got I to gotta hurry. She knew she was in need of a miracle. It was, it was, it was, it was pucker time. She, and when she heard, she doesn't do like people in church today do. When the man of God preached it, you know what she did? She did it. Because I don't really understand Christians today. Man, if I if, if I talk if I talk to some of you like he did, you'd be like, "Well, I gotta pray about that." <laughs> well, God didn't really call me to that. I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll, let me go pray about that. I see you the next time I show up to church. Hold on. Wait. Let me go find someone to stand in agreement with me on this. You know, Pastor Elisha. Let me get back to you. I'll let you know. But this poor widow shows us something. I want to make this point and then I, I got I to gotta close. When he said, go borrow the, the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door. Praise just compels, oh, Jesus. Why shut the door? You just sent her to knock every door. You just sent her to everybody, oh, not only to open their door, but to give her a vessel to bring to her house. And I got to be honest here. At first glance, it does seem kind of confusing. But to fully understand the miracle of increase, only God can take our little and make it a lot. I get that. I understand that. I've explained that. But Elisha went on to say, after collecting all the pots, go home and shut the door. Everybody say, shut the door. You got a widow in need. She went to the man of God and she acted on the faith and did what was taught. No, I figure God was going to give her her miracle or increase whether the door was shut or not. She'd already, she already did everything she was instructed to do as far as getting pots and needing a place to store the oil. What's the door got to do with it? God really began to deal with me on this. I think Elijah was on to something here that would really benefit us today. And he was very specific. He was very clear. And I said before, you can have your miracle, but you got to have faith. But what Elijah's saying here is you can have your miracle, but you got to have faith and you got to shut the door. 
And I believe that many of us, and I need you to hear me today, and, and, and I may not be screaming and running and shouting like normal, but we've missed out. Some of you have missed out. Some of you have even lost the blessings and miracles that have your name on it, that were meant for you because you failed to understand the principle of having a door that is shut. There is a ministry in your house. If you're the priest of your home and you're the lady of the house, that first thought, what, what, what is the significance of shutting the door? Why shut the door? Why do we keep our doors shut? Whether it's environmentally, you wanted a certain temperature in there. And the outside doesn't always comply. And you want a certain temperature. Mm. See, many people after church say, oh, did he have a move, God, or not? Move? What was the temperature in the church today? <laughs> well, where'd you set the thermostat? In your spiritual walk. I know where I'm at, and I know what I'm feeling. So, to shut the door was to exclude outside influences. Not only outside influences, but what was going on and what she just did created a stir. She excluded interruption. She was setting the stage in obedience by doing what the man of God said. You shut that door because what was going to go on there was you didn't want anybody to interrupt the flow of God. You didn't want anything to interrupt the flow and the filling and the process which can only be done in God's presence. So, oh, brothers and sisters, hear me today. There's more to in that. When our world and our neighbors know that we're in need, when they know that we're going through a storm, and your neighbors know, and the police have been to your house, and this is going on, and that's going on, and they're looking, and they're watching, and they've heard this, and they've heard that, and you're just trying to make ends meet, and your world's turned upside down. We have to understand that when we've heard from God, and he's given us specific instructions because we have a bad habit of letting outside forces interrupt what God can do. We allow the things of this world to interrupt, to interfere, to influence what God wants to do. How many of you allowed someone to speak doubt after you've walked out of here with faith? How many times has God moved on you to maybe a ministry or maybe to a calling only to leave and spend a week out there with worldliness and pleasure and trivialities and then time has passed and 5, 10, 15 years later, you sit there with nothing new even though you know you heard the instructions clearly. Maybe it was a simple co-worker you're going to church and you get your faith destroyed by doubt and your miracle is lost. And much like the parable of the soils and the birds came and devoured the seed because a neighbor, a friend, and even a family member can talk us right out of our blessing. I don't know how many times I've watched as God is working on a man or a woman or a child only to watch it fail. Not that God wasn't able, not that God could, but some, God help me, someone spoke out, drug them out of the church, caused division in the home, ripped the home apart because they, oh, Oh, you need to hear what I'm saying today. <laughs> the enemy, the thief, is using people to steal your miracle. Steal from you through TV and movies and radios and talking heads that don't love your family. They're all in it for the money. While your life and your family's being torn apart. What do you mean, church? What do you mean you got a pastor? What do you mean? The next thing you know, what are you doing that for? What are you praying for? That don't make sense. What are you listening to that for? You don't know what you're doing. It doesn't take all of that. Don't waste your time. Don't fill out that application. You're not going to get the job. Can't you hear the widow's neighbors if she'd not shut the door? 
what are you doing in there? You're going to pour that little empty pot in? Well, oh. well, how many of you just walking through life, someone makes a snide comment? Just four years ago, we wouldn't say Merry Christmas around this country because we were afraid. Don't you tell me you're not influenced. As big as and bad as we want to be as men, mm, y'all need to quit lying. Be honest. Oh, God, the world has influenced us. It makes a difference on us. We need to start. Wait a minute. I got to shut the door on some things around here. I got to shut the door. I want my miracles. What are you taking all those empty pots for? And they ridicule her. You don't have nothing of value. Shame on you. They shame her. You lost your husband. You lost your mind now, too. They insult her. Can you imagine? What, what are you going to do with all that? Can you just imagine the bombardment that she would get, that we get, when we stop to finally do something different with our lives and give our lives to our creator, start going to church and start being faithful and be believing God. People start, yeah, that, it still bothers me to this day that my family literally said to me, we liked you better as a drug dealer. Yeah. Let me tell you something. I don't care if it's a boyfriend, if it's a girlfriend, if it's a family member, if it's a spouse trying to de drag you out of the house of God. You need to go read Job's. You're talking as a foolish person. Don't you? As for me and my... Jo Joshua knew something. As for me and my house, and if I got to shut the door and keep the rest of you out, I'm going to shut the door. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to trust God. times have we allowed a worldly fly to spoil our ointment you've been so blessed and God has moved and some of you are feeling a tugging in your spirit right now with this message about shutting the door and I'm going to tell you as soon as you walk out of here that enemy's going to try to fly a door in you put a fly through your door and influence you're going to try to get something in there because if you go home and you shut the door to the world if you go home and make a stand for the miracles if you go home and you finally shut the door and say ask for me and my, that enemy's going to give a sign himself. Amen. Elijah knew what he was doing. Amen. When you go home, there's a miracle with your name on it. You better shut the door and uh, don't let some no name steal it from you. You better stand up. Oh, no, no, no. Not in my house. Not here. It's time to shut the door. It's time to say, not in this house. No more. Not that and not even you. You can go with it. And I can say that, been there, done it. Put my foot down, had enough. Go, take your tricks, take your junk with you. You've got to make a stand. You've got to make a choice. Too many people waffle between the world and the church, because the, the world doesn't mind, the enemy don't mind that because he knows that you're faking it and God, God's already put in his word. You can't serve both. See, we think we can balance it. We think we can balance it. We think, oh, I got balance. Do you realize everything that you put on the world? You didn't give to God. So you have to stop and ask. Maybe you're your own fly in the ointment. Maybe you're the reason. The miracle because you wouldn't shut your own door. Sometimes you got to keep noisy neighbors out. You got to shut the door. Sometimes you got to let your friends walk out of your life so that you can keep the blessings of God in your life. And shut the door. Don't let the ungodly world in. Shut the door. They don't need to understand your business. It ain't none of their business. Shut the door. Some folks are in a messed up bad shape because they've not simply learned to shut the door. You're not growing spiritually, shut the door. Come on. Come on. 
God's not moving in your life, shut the door. You don't have the Holy Ghost yet? Shut the door. Jesus teached this principle. That great sermon on the mount. But thou, we say me. When you pray, enter into your closet. And when thou hast shut the door. You got to get tired of the influence. You get tired of the world speaking. You got to get tired of the. You have, you know. Let me ask. Let me just show you something. You ever wake up with a worldly song you haven't heard for years in your head? Our psyche holds on to that stuff. I tell you right now, I, uh, there are songs that I can hear if I'm in a department store or wherever Matt Nick comes on. It immediately takes me. There are songs that can come on, and I'll date myself here, from the 70s. And it puts me right back on that school bus with Mr. Brewer driving. Or it takes me back to them high school days. <laughs> I don't want to go there. So what do you do? Shut the door. Sometimes, and we need to understand the meaning of a closed door. No more. No more. Many of us. Anybody ever missed a great deal or something and you realize, well, that door closed. We blame it on God. Well, God just didn't call me that. Oh, he did. You just didn't shut the door on other things to do. Let's stand. You don't need everybody in your business. You don't need to tell everybody your business. In fact, most of you who's counseled with me, I tell you right here and right now, I don't want you telling anybody in the church. Anybody? Well, don't raise your hand. Uh, Y'all know that's what I say to you. I wish I could take credit for it, but it's what I learned from my pastor. I asked him, when you can, what do you do? And he said, one of the first things, shut your mouth. Stop telling people. Why are you making them stuff? Why are you making them think... He said, man, Brother Cole, we're not running and jumping and shouting in here. I, 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 running and jumping and shouting in here is easy. I want you to start living the way you can run and jump and shout out Come there. On. Come on. That's good. Come on. Amen. Because when you learn, because people don't, people don't. Guys, I'm going to say, us dressing and living modestly and dressing modestly, that ain't going to get no one's attention. The devil doesn't exploit us with this. He exploits us with our covetousness, with our wrathfulness, and with our doubt. There's just going to come a day that whatever I preach ain't going to float that boat. But your knowledge of the Word of God should always float that boat. There are just some days that maybe I miss it because I didn't shut the door and there's something in there that's messed my ability to read. Right, right, right. I, I'll break it to you right now. I, I fear it because I've done it and I'll do it again. There's a saying preachers have when they don't preach good. They call it drop the watermelon. Yeah, it's a, well, you ever try to put a watermelon back together? And the other implication is the only reason you dropped the watermelon is because you done stole it and you're running with it. So you go down that road. <laughs> the wonderful thing is, is they messed up watermelon so bad now you, you, you can run with probably two of them. Back when I was a kid, they, their watermelon's as big as I was. But let me show you something. Sister Crow, come here. See this? These are work clothes for you. Yeah. This ain't going to attract attention. This. But when you see a woman walk in our society today with uncut hair, looking like that, acting like she acts, doing what she does, dress like that, well, what's with you? 
exploit you. Because how are women exploited today? Oh, but that's bondage in the church. Really? See, I was raised in the world. I had a mother and a sister. They, 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 they couldn't check the mail without getting dolled up. Doll, dolled, dolled, dolled. Do you, you want to know where that came from? Cadavers. The dead. Dressing up the dead. We're not dead. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a hypocrite. You ready for me to be a hypocrite? I'm gonna be a hypocrite because I'm gonna sing a song. Well, I'm not gonna sing. I don't sing good. Preachers, I love you just the way you are. See, I lived in the world. I kid you not. I've, I've, I've talked and had friends and met them and gone out and they look great. And then the next thing you know, I'm in a room. I don't even recognize. What? Oh yeah, I don't have my makeup on. Bondage, you know what bondage is? That's bondage. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it is. What? How does a, where, where did the world get off telling you you weren't beautiful? Come on, come on. <laughs> where'd that come from? Where'd that come from to where you think you, you got to pierce yourself all over the place? You need to see the bed. You got to get pierced all and put metal on it. I'm going to help you with something. If my house is on fire, I'm not looking to save my gold. I'm getting my carcass out of there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when the Titanic was sinking, the story's told that people literally were taking the money out of their pockets and putting oranges in. Why? You're worth more than all. Where do we get off thinking we need to decorate ourselves with the things of this world? Don't you realize how fearfully and wonderfully made you are? Nothing more painful than you see these little, these kids and these, 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 forgive me, stupid's a bad word, ignorant is not. Ignorant people think they got to take a baby, still, pierce its ears, paint its face. Are you kidding me? Have you th- seen anything more beautiful than a baby? Where's this coming from? Who told you? Remember what, what the Lord said to Adam and Eve? Who told you you were in it? We need to start shutting the door. This world wants to make you feel inferior. This world wants to make you feel inadequate. This world wants to make you doubt God and to doubt the things. you got to get to the place. I'm going to shut the door on that so that my room is full of the blessings and the miracles. I've learned that I've got to steal myself away from all the influence. I'll never forget, I had a young girl in the first church that I pastored, and though I knew what she was saying, and I said it to myself before, her parents were in a mess. She had great aspirations. She was going to college and taking 17 or 18 credits. She worked as the bookkeeper for Hobby Lobby. She was my music director. How she did it all, I don't know. But she was amazing. And I watched as her life was falling apart around her. I watched her and one day she was just down in prayer and she got up, tears streaming down her face. And she made the statement, and many times I walk in here and everything seems to be falling apart and I can't make sense of anything. But when I get down in prayer, when I get down in prayer and I have that little talk with Jesus and I get to that place alone with a God that truly loves me and cares for me and likes me, made me the way I look and loves the way I look. She said, 